Hi, I'm Terry Bozio. Welcome to a very special edition of the Art of Drumming show. Um, this is really important for me because this guy here is uh, one of my major uh, musical influences. And uh, he and a few others that uh, we all grew up together in Marin County, uh, are, they are responsible for all of my musical sensibilities. All the things that I gleaned from them, you know, as we uh, were working through our almost teenage years, <laughs> but, uh, our 20s and all, uh, you know, ha has been uh, the, the, the sort of paths that I subscribe to or follow and, uh, you know, just have been very helpful to me. Uh, I found a lot of truth there. So, um, this is a composer. So, you know, I try to play the drums in a compositional manner, and my whole Art of Drumming series is about applying all the musical, uh, you know, uh, elements. Uh, rhythm, melody, dynamics, harmony, and orchestration, choice of instrument. Uh, all those things uh, I try to apply to my drumming. And, uh, you know, whether I'm playing in an ensemble or not. And uh, this man here is a fantastic composer. And I first saw him play in high school where my music teacher said, hey, you've got to check out this little kid from Terra Linda, you know. <laughs> and so, you know, here was Mark playing with a big band and uh, just killing it, you know. And um, so I was impressed and... Uh, Somehow later we met and uh, started to play together, and um, you know from there we did Group 87 together. I've done many of his records and quite a few of his movies, and uh, now he is a film score composer <laughs> par excellence. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my dear friend from 50 years we, we've known each other, uh, Mark Isham. Well, thank you very much, Terry. It's such, such a pleasure. <laughs> such a pleasure. <laughs> well, for me too, really, man. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, more than 50. Yeah. <laughs> if you're really counting. 50. Yeah. Yeah, because I, I remember Van Scotto uh -huh. studied from Chuck Brown. Yes. And he came back because he and I went to the same high school. And he said, there's this kid at Drake High School that's the real shit. <laughs> oh, I thought he was the real <laughs> <laughs> And that's why I first heard of you. Uh, so literally went to different high schools together. Uh, yeah. With the sa same influences and same love and passion of where we were headed. Yeah. And we met, I think, right after high school, I think. Yeah. yeah. We played together first <laughs> in Group 87. Well, first we were the Tritone Trio, right? We were. In your kitchen yeah. in Terra Linda, <laughs> in an Eichler home, you yeah. know, which was a very beautiful <laughs> style of architecture. So, uh, yeah, and it was just me and you and Pete. Yeah. And then uh, we were always searching for places to jam and things to do. And by that time, I remember you got busy and I'd be in Barbara's garage, you know, waiting for a day <laughs> where maybe Mark was free and we could find a bass player and all. So, uh, but it was good because uh, I got to practice and, you know, yeah. hang out. And I remember when you went on uh, the ship for a while and, and did that gig and then yeah. came back, you know. And, um, Very I, informative jam sessions we had in those days. Yeah, I, I mean, mean. I learned a tremendous amount. Yes. I remember with, when we finally found Pat O'Hearn. Yeah. And it was the four of us. And uh, I think it was in Pete's living room at that point. And, uh, but just... You know, picking a key center and a tempo and just saying, all right, let's, let's, let's stay there for 20 minutes and see what happens. Yeah. You know, just learning, learning that art of conversation mm. in improvisation, which to me is the, the essence of the beauty of real improvisation. Yeah. You know, it's one thing to, to practice all your, your stuff and then you get up and just, and, and, and hope that they're, they're accompanying you. Well, that, that to me is, that, that's not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in, in Ears are always open to what's happening in the room. Yeah, and you say something and I answer, and then and then I take it a step further and you respond to that. And <clears throat> when you have four or five people that can do that as an ensemble, that's a very special thing. Yeah. That's a very very special thing. And to me, it still probably trumps any other <laughs> musical yeah. experience when it when it works. Man, it's because you're on a tightrope. You know, yep. it's not planned. It's not rehearsed. Yeah, and yet. When it's working, it can come out as if it's the most perfectly constructed piece of music ever written. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I heard something by uh, uh, Joe Zawin on interview the other day that uh, he, he was saying, you know, everything I do is improvised. I may write it down later, you know, and have people, other people play it, yeah. but basically it's coming from this place of improvisation where you don't know what's going to come out. You just kind of are yeah. in the moment. I mean, yeah. I can take credit for showing up, you know, and, and you know, doing my best, but then it's like something just comes through, and as, a, as an ensemble, when it's all coming through, it's just magic, you yeah. know? And uh, it, I, I always described it as like a one-time only, you know, uh, sort of authentic and honest, uh, yeah. you know, musical experience and, and sharing, never to be repeated, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, when it's on, it's, it's fantastic. The, um, the idea of improvisation, I have a little section in some of my books and, and lessons called Improv 101. <laughs> and of course, the first rule is listen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and that's very important because a lot of people don't get that when they think they're going to improvise. You yeah. know? The first thing you do is you don't start playing. You, yeah. you listen for work, the environment that you're in and figure out what, what's the language. Yeah. You know? and, and I mean, you know, this is something too where, uh, you know, Miles and Weather Report did it. They were, you know, ultimately highly trained musicians, but they had this amazing uh, sort of sensibility of, of uh, improvisation yeah. and, you know, letting go and being in the moment. There's so many choices you can make, you know, to play with somebody or to play against them. You know, if they're high pitch, you can play low pitch or, you know, so many choices. And I, I've tried to list a lot of those things, you <laughs> oh. know, play, play busy and yeah. loud, you know, play uh, yeah. soft and sparse, you know, leave yeah. space, you know, don't play, uh, you know. Interfere with somebody, and I put, that happens a lot. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but, but but the beauty of that is if you can do that causatively. Yeah, you know. Yeah, and 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 find that you don't interfere with someone without knowing that you're doing it. Yeah, yeah. Because that then, then there's that moment that it's compositional. That yeah, point, and it'll have strength and it'll have structure. Yeah, and, and it'll I, communicate because yeah. ultimately you want to be able to communicate this. And yeah, it's a communication between here that needs to move outward into yeah. an audience. Yeah, and that's where sometimes I'll just take maybe the tempo of a quarter note triplet and, uh, you know, if I feel something needs to move somewhere and yeah. just start drifting into that time zone yeah. and pulling everyone with me, yeah. you know, that's an idea of interfering, but in a good way. You know? Exactly. Like, well, let's go here. You know, exactly. we've, been, we've said that. Yeah. <laughs> So, you know, one of the people that was a profound influence upon me, and we shared him for a brief period, was Art Landy. Yeah, oh, God. And he is a master of this, of course. And I learned a lot of these things that we're mentioning here in working with him. Because he he's, was a little more experienced and a little older and, and really had sorted a lot of this out in his own mind and mm -hmm. could communicate it very well to the people he was playing with. Yeah, this, this brings me to what we were talking about just a few minutes ago, which was this time in San Francisco. Yeah. The big bands of that time were still going strong. The Dead were still there. Santana's at its height. You know, yeah. it, was, it was a very big music town. Yeah, Larry really Graham, was. right? Larry and, Graham, uh, right. Yeah, Sly and the Family Stone, just yeah. so much, yeah. Yeah, we were so lucky. And I, you know, you were a big part of that, you know, for me. So... I'm trying to think now. We were talking about Munich earlier, where Munich. I just happened to be in, uh, I think I was in France at the time, working yeah. with the Lonely Bears and Tony Hymas. Oh. So I get a call from Mark, or you called my home, and somebody told me I had to, uh, you know, go do a movie with Mark Isham in <laughs> Munich. And I, great, you know, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> so we show up, and this is for uh, Who's Afraid of, or Who Killed Jessica Rabbit? Uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, it was called Cool World. Cool World, that's cool it. Cool World. And Brad Pitt was in it, right? Brad Pitt. A young, and, unknown uh, to me, Brad right. Pitt. <laughs> Kim Basinger. Kim Basinger. Um, yeah, and, and, and it was for Paramount, and it was, it was half big orchestral, half big swing band. And I was at a period where I, I really, there was, this was before this Hollywood took this sort of crunch and dropped all the budgets in post-production. So we had a little more money in those days. Mm -hmm. And Paramount was always looking, was, was always encouraging me to find s some sort of interesting thing to do on each score. And I was really into that. So I was thinking, well, they, but you need a period jazz band and 
you have an orchestra, and it's just, I said, well, what could we do that would be really interesting? I said, I wonder, and by this time, you, you had become Terry Bozio. Oh, right? And you had yeah. the big kit, right? <laughs> and uh, I said, well, I wonder what would happen if we put Terry in this, because there's gonna be drums with the orchestra, mm -hmm. and there's gonna be drums with the jazz band. Yeah. But Terry is more than just putting drums with this. This is like putting a, a force of nature <laughs> and a very unique and very a, a big personality as the rhythm behind this score. Oh, thank you. And I just said, uh, where is he? So, and then he was in Europe. And I said, oh, shit. And then a few days later, they said, you have to record in Europe, you know. Wait a minute. Oh, well, maybe, <laughs> maybe we can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, it and was a ball. Yeah, I think I, it was a, a flight from Paris to, to yeah. Munich, and you were there. Yeah. With the kit. Yeah. But I'll never forget the the few cues that you played the the Bozio kit of that of the nineties. Uh, right? yeah, yeah. In front of a, a full German Philharmonic Orchestra. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's an image that, that I'll never I'll never forget. Yeah, yeah. So it was quite an experience for them. They'd never seen or heard anything <laughs> like it before. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, wow. that, that the Lonely Bears was kind of that way too. It it, it had a lot of classical sensibilities, mm -hmm. you know, and and light playing and reading and complicated mm -hmm. things that Tony had composed. But, you know, with that drum set, the way it sounded, you know, was uh, well, which kind of came from Castalia era, mm. uh, you know, and and yeah. uh, wasn't the first time that had been heard. And now the recent thing you're doing is. Uh, Sort of from the Shaft movie, right? Uh, the Godfather of Harlem is. A oh, the Godfather song. of Harlem, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I wouldn't say it's like Shaft. It's it's. Uh, no, it's it, just it, the character of Shaft uh, was uh, dealing with Bumpy Johnson, who was the Godfather. Of, oh, really? Yeah. Oh, I never realized. that. Oh, yeah. That's why I send you these little jokes <laughs> in my emails. You jive, Bumpy. Well, you I know, know that. Yeah. Stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> Bumpy gets that all the time from oh, lots of God. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's interesting. I, I, you know, it just came on out of my control yeah. on some kind of a Fox affiliate in Japan. And I was able uh -huh. to start watching it. Yeah. And that's another thing, too. Uh, I had never seen the Harvey Milk thing. Mm. And I was laying in bed one night and heard this beautiful music. I turned turned it on just as it ended. Mm. So the, the ending credits was In Pursuit of Liberty, which is one of the pieces right. that we had done on that tour right. And uh, from that movie. And I'm like, yeah. you know, having one of those moments, like, this music is so familiar to me. What, you know, oh, it's, it's got to be Mark. <laughs> yeah, I remember from that tour. Oh, this is In Pursuit of Liberty. Yeah. And, you know, so yeah. it all came together like that. But yeah, yeah. Um, and then the moderns. Can you talk a little bit about that? That's one of my favorite film uh, scores. I love the just well, the that vibe. Well, that of that. course was was probably one of the. I did eleven films with Alan Rudolph, mm. and this was I still think probably our best. We, we Afterglow wasn't bad either, but uh, I should I should mention Afterglow after this. Mm. Uh, good drummer story. Mm. Uh, but the moderns, yeah, it, and Oster Piazzolla was was being listened to by the director, and and so I was I this French cabaret music, you know, the tango music, all this stuff, and again, at first I was saying, oh, what do I know about this stuff? I, I'm scared shitless here. I, I I don't know how to do this. <laughs> but don't you wish you could go back and visit in that time? Oh, I mean, you are know, you cafe kidding? Society it, it just and, you know, it was such a Paris. joy to immerse myself in that yeah. music and to live in it for a couple of months while I'm writing this stuff. And you could go back, but only have penicillin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> and I couldn't. Very difficult to write it at any sort of electronics. So I'm at the piano. Went went to my out of tune piano in the corner. I pretty much wrote it all there on pencil and paper, and then only mocked it up on the on the computer. Just in fact, we had very early computers in those days. Not not much, but I could at least mock up something and play it to picture and make sure it would fit. You know, get the timings right. And then, and I'm still not sure how to do this. And I call Pete, say, "Well, Pete, would you play violin?" He said, "Well, I haven't really practiced much, <laughs> and, you know, and I know a good piano player, so I'm good there." And then the producer comes to me and says. Oh, I've got this friend, you know, who gave me his record, and I'm like, oh God, a producer's friend. This is a nightmare, you know. I don't want to hear about a producer's friend. And I said, I take the record and I, and I listen to it. I said, well, this guy can play. 
I had no other, I didn't, I wasn't in the scene in LA at that point. I didn't really know a lot of people. And I said, all right, I'm just gonna throw the dice here. Turned out this was Sid Page, mm. who had played with uh, Dan Hicks and the Hot Licks. Mm. He played with Slide and Family Stone, but he's also a trained classical violinist. Wow. And a good improviser. And he came in and he killed this thing. And so <laughs> Pete played second fiddle and was very comfortable playing second fiddle. <laughs> Sid did all the solos, and Sid became my secret weapon for mm. years. Just a brilliant improvising violinist, mm. which, mm. which uh, there are a lot more these days, but in those days it was a little rare. And uh, so he became the voice of that, that mm. score. And that once, when that happened, the whole thing just sort of took, came to life you know, yeah. in the hands, hands of somebody like that. You are a complete musician. You're totally qualified for that, you know? The, I, I've always discovered that, that I think what really attracts me about film scoring is that every, op I, every film is an opportunity to learn more about music. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I was not a trained film composer when I started. I no, was, but you know, you're, you're definitely, you know. I was, I was a trained musician. Yeah. I was a trained classical musician with a, with a certain amount of background in composition, but not, not a college gradu graduate in composition and certainly knew nothing about film scoring from a technical point of view at all. But, so I sort of learned on the job. Mm. I knew just enough to not get fired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just learned on the job. And to this day, I mean, I'm, I'm doing a film right now, which, you know, there's a big flamenco aspect of it. I said, oh, wow. oh my God, you know. you know. Oh yeah, that's right, it's all that flat nine stuff. How mm. cool. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you know, so it's fun, it's really fun. Yeah, the flamenco thing really has a lot of passion, so a I'm lot of sure passion. you're going to yeah. enjoy that. Yeah. But there's one story that I thought you would get a kick out of. Uh -huh. um, I was, because Alan Rudolph did the, a film called Afterglow. Mm -hmm. It had a really stellar cast with Julie Christie and Nick Nolte and a bunch of other uh, wonderful actors. And in fact, there were six leading actors in it. It was a story of three couples. And... Uh, is that true? Three couples? Two couples. Three. Anyway. And he'd written the whole script to a jazz album of mine, a quintet album. Wow. And so when he got the script greenlit, he said, you know, so you just have to do another one of those albums. <laughs> I said, yeah, but you don't understand, that album was, <laughs> a lot of improvisation on that album. This is, you know, I only did some sketches of tunes and got the right guys in the room. And he said, we'll do that. I thought about it, I said, well, this is frightening. There's not a film studio in the world that would ever let you do that, right? They want to know what it is, you're gonna spend this money and you they need to hear it, you need to hear demos. You know, and he said, no, 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 I'll just, you know, this is the money you have, you do what you want to do. It's not a lot of money, but it, it should be enough. Right? And so I, I came up with this idea of actually doing a jazz film score. Mm -hmm. I took each of the characters in the film and I signed them an instrument. All right, so we had Sid Page, violin, trumpet, me. I got Charles Lloyd. Wow. Tenor sax. I got Gary Burton on vibes. Wow. I got um, Jerry Allen on piano. Mm. And I had Billy Higgins on drums. Yeah, man. The last session I think he ever did. Really? Yeah. Oh, man. And, and especially now I'm saying, there can't be any click tracks here. I've got Billy Higgins. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, am I going to give Billy Higgins headphones and a click track? There's not a chance I'm doing that. All right, so how am I going to do this? All right, so every, every character had an instrument. So then I wrote a, a jazz tune, which is, you know, eight, 16 bars, chord changes, melody, maybe a, a little line that you might play all together here and there. Mm -hmm. You know, a jazz tune, just sketchy. And for each idea, like betrayal, you know, passion, you know, that the story embodied these like five or six major ideas or mm. emotions. And I went through the script and said, all right, well, Julie Christie and Nick Nolte are being passionate here. So that's trumpet and violin with this song. And uh, I forget the actor's names. He, he and her and this song. And so that was Lloyd and, and Jerry Allen. Mm. And I just, and I, so then we got to the session. Yeah. And we passed out and put Lloyd and Jerry Allen and Mr. Higgins in the room and said, this is the song. And I'd gone through the picture and I, with a metronome, and I'd say, look, if, if they play the first 24 bars at this tempo, it'll, it'll come to this cut, and then the, the bridge will be nice on this next section. So that's the tempo. Mm. 
And then I just had the metronome. I said to Billy, one, two, one, two. And that was it. Yeah. Shouldn't and he hit the bridge every time. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> his, I mean, he was just the master, the yeah. master of that stuff. Just so good. Yeah. So I got to do a great session with Charles Lloyd and Jerry Allen and Billy Higgins and, and play real jazz, and it's in a film. Talked about Bumpy. Do you want to talk about that? Can we talk about Bumpy? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. You know, I've, I have a long uh, relationship with ABC Productions, and uh, so when they got the, the uh, job of producing this show for uh, epics called uh, The Godfather of Harlem, uh, they said, well, send in a demo, and I did. I, did. I, wasn't the, I didn't get the job at first. Mm. And then they went through a couple of other composers, and then uh, they came to their senses. And they hired me. <laughs> I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and you know, the, the writer of that, um, Chris Brancato, is, is, is a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant writer, showrunner. And of course, you have one of our finest actors of our generation yeah. is, is in the lead. So. It's, it's a wonderful show to do, and it's a period piece, of course, so we get to dip into what that might mean, but we're not stuck there because the other great musical aspect of this show is Swizz Beats is writing original songs for it, and of course that's very contemporary. Mm -hmm. So the whole idea here is to have the ability to have a contemporary song over a period piece, have the score then be able to sort of waft you in and out of, and then you have the deal drops. Mm. So the score takes this interesting job of moving between Swizz in the very modern and the needle drops of the exact time and place of what you're looking at and, mm. and live in both worlds and draw them, put them together. Yeah. So we do some things that are very uh, period with real drums and bass and mm. organs and then other stuff that's a little more exotic. Yeah. And we have a real small string section. And so it's a lot of fun. Cool. A lot of fun. Yeah. I enjoy it. You know, I'm always like more, <laughs> more Mark, you know. <laughs> Can you turn the volume <laughs> up on some of these things? Yeah, who's mixing this? <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, there's other, other movies that just drive me crazy because the music is so loud I can't hear the dialogue. And, and you know, <laughs> but that's just life. I, I, I should get some kind of like really expensive uh, compressor limiter and just <laughs> listen to everything, you know, my way. I was wondering maybe what you look for in a drummer or a percussionist mm. might be a good topic, and then we'll close. Well, I suppose we'll close it depends it. on what it's for. Yeah. Obviously. Um, yeah, it's, it, it is casting, I think, it, choosing musicians at this point, at this point in my life, because I do do so many different types of music. Um, and so I, I get very specific about casting the right, persons. Um, like the, the story with Charles Lloyd and, and Billy, I mean, Charles said, yeah, I'll, I'll do this, but I have to have my, my guys. I said, well, who are your guys? He said, well, Billy Higgins. I said, well, how does that happen? He said, I'll call him. So <laughs> yeah. sometimes it's, it's getting people that you know interact well together. Yeah. Like if I knew that I could get you and Pat O'Hearn, mm -hmm. you know, if I, if, I had, if I knew I had you, it might be a stretch after that to find the bass player that we know that would fit well, you know. Yeah, depending on so the So what situation. do I want a drummer? It depends, you know, well, I want you. But <laughs> if <laughs> well, I can't get you, you I mean, I, li I like a drummer who's, who's for lack of, and I, and I don't mean this insultingly, but it, it is said this way very often, who's musical. Hmm. Because sometimes you don't get that in drummers. You get, you get more of a, a role, uh, I'm the timekeeper, and that's really all I'm interested in doing. Uh, I love you, I love Vinny. Because I, you're very compositional, you're, you're conversational in your playing, but you also do understand the mechanics of your role. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and in certain types of band situations, you've got to do what you've got to do to make the whole thing sound good. And a drummer probably has the most crucial role, and sometimes the most restrictive, in that that rhythm and the time has to be in the pocket, as yeah. they say. Yeah. And if it's not, everyone's going to have a problem. So, I look for that stability, that ability to just make the room and the musical room at ease and comfortable and the time feel great. Mm. And then a musician, an interacting, loving, sharing, caring yeah. musician. And do you look uh, for 
you know, like uh, somewhat some creativity or innovation in, in, uh, in the drumming uh, or, well, it depends, right? Like no, I, said, I do, I do. And that's one of the reasons that, that you know, I mean, we played together because we knew each other, and we and I, we I just we knew we admired each other's talent from a very, very young age. I feel age. very free but, with you, yeah. You know, like in Castalia or the first Group Eighty Seven record, it became very apparent how perfect you were because you would compose drum beats. You would take the time to not just go dunk, 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 dunk. Yeah. Dunk. You would go dunk, cut, cut, ding. Yeah. <laughs> ding, ding. ding <laughs> you know, to find this personality, you know, you, to, to listen to what we were doing and, and be compositional in mm -hmm. your approach. And I think in, in certain band situations, that, that's brilliant. It's just totally brilliant. I love that in a, in a drummer. Yeah. Might not be appropriate thing to do all the time. It might be in certain sessions, you know, when you're doing something that has to be this, it's just got to be, Yeah. <laughs> you know. But, you know, I've seen you do that. Yeah. And do it, you know, better than anybody. Just well, sit know, there and do the, the four on the floor. <laughs> yeah, whatever is called for, you know. Yeah. So, you know, he said timing one. It's got to feel good yeah. and then maybe a little bit of uh, creativity and innovation. Yeah. yeah. And then if it's, you know, like an orchestral or, or percussion thing, it's, it's somebody, I do like people who can read, yeah. I got to say. Yeah. If you don't read, but you're very quick, as quick as if you did read, I don't care. Yeah, right. <laughs> but the speed of someone who can learn something quickly, I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. I, do. I remember I worked with Basil Polidorus one time, mm. and I hadn't read in God, you know years. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I have no problem reading uh, or comprehending anything you know yeah. that's written down. But uh, what I had a problem with was um, doing my composed choreographed beat and keeping the, my place <laughs> in the music. So I remember, yeah. I think his name's Tom Smalley, who is a orchestrator. Oh, yeah. And, you know, yeah. he was there with his clear triangle kind of showing me the bars <laughs> as they went by. And, I, you know, and I could like, oh, okay, and here comes this fill. Oh, no yeah. problem, you know, da-da-da. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Play what, whatever you're supposed to play. But, but yeah, trying to remember, you know, the coordination and, 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 yeah. uh, and all and repeat that uh, flawlessly, you know, with a good time and yeah. making everybody feel good yeah. uh, was just more than I could do with, uh, you know, in, in that kind of situation. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Haven't read in a long time. And I feel it's almost like, wow, you know, what's the point these days? I mean, I, you know, for me, if I make a perfect uh, track uh, or a composition with, with reason, mm -hmm. uh, and then that's saved as a MIDI file, you yeah. know, then I export it to Sibelius and deal with that mess that it yeah. makes. <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> dangling ties and all that kind of but yeah. yeah, you know. Yeah, the reading, I mean, the last 18 months have been interesting and just making music, recording music, putting it all together. Obviously, there's lots of new, and thank God we do have the technology we had today. If this had happened 25 years ago, the music business would have stopped. Yeah, yeah. But it didn't because of the technology, which, yeah, is, yeah. which is great. So, um, so reading, yeah, may, may, may not be as necessary because if you bring something into your own environment, you create it and you send it back out into the world, you do it on your own terms. Yeah. I've you seen, know. you know, I've seen this work magically and I've seen it uh, fail. <laughs> you know, like uh, <laughs> the Lonely Bears did a thing called uh, Oyate, which was Tony Hymas's mm -hmm. Western uh, compositions and uh, uh, some Indians, mm -hmm. uh, for, uh, you know, Native Americans from mm -hmm. all over the United States doing their thing. And there was one uh, where it just didn't work. I mean, this guy was, I believe, Navajo and had this tiny little deerskin drum that was filled with water and it was really tight mm -hmm. and it kind of gave a pitch and he was just singing this story and, you know, mm -hmm. beautiful line. And you can imagine this guy doing this out in the yeah. desert, you know, and pitch <laughs> doesn't matter, you know. Yeah. So, and that day, you know, uh, Tony had reharmonized with a string quartet the, uh, uh, you know, the piece, and they had it all set. And, uh, you know, we um, went to rehearsals, and suddenly there was a, a pitch that just didn't work. So yeah. 
all the guys are great readers, right? So can you transpose to this pitch? Yeah, no problem. So works great, right? Then the night of the show, maybe the spotlight was a little too high or something. <laughs> the deer skin stretched yeah, another corner of an inch. <laughs> yeah, so it was in like, uh, you know, in the cracks. And so Tony's oh up there God. ready to bring in that and no. Forget it. So it's just like oh this, you know, four yeah. or five minutes of just acapella singing, which yeah. was beautiful, and yeah. the audience probably didn't know. Right. But sometimes those things collide instead yeah. of <laughs> merging, you know. Yeah. And then other times you bring in like uh, maybe an African guy, and he just like you know makes the whole thing come alive. Yeah. You know, like Mamba Di Keita in, yeah. in some of these situations, uh, just you go, oh my God, this yeah. is so much better than yeah. you know. Than yeah. a, just a white guy playing <laughs> drums. You know? this, this is like a whole, yeah. you know, whole other universe. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. rich, rich taste, you yeah. know, of of, uh, of expression. So, yeah. 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 Well, Mark, I love you, my friend, uh, and it is great to see you, and likewise. great to hear from likewise. you, and great to learn more from you. And uh, all my life, I've oh. I've just really appreciated uh, how you have affected my life. It's made oh, my well. life better, and uh, I enjoy that, and I hope it will help these other drummers to, uh, to learn a little something and, uh, and pick up the whatever. <laughs> 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 yeah, pick up the keyboard and, and start plunking in notes. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. it's been a great pleasure. I mean, you've been a, a huge influence, and, and I've admired your, your tenacity in all the things you've done over the years, and your superb artistry. It's really just, it's always been inspiring. So. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mark. Really I appreciate pleasure. it. What was it Chuck Brown used to say? Patience, practice, and perseverance. Perseverance. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I started, I started composing at 40. <laughs> like a child. <laughs> All right, well, it's our great pleasure to have Mark Isham with us, and thank you. We'll see you next time on The Art of Drumming. Mark Isham, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Terry.